In today's podcast, I am joined by professional tennis better and tipster, Aidan. Welcome to the podcast, Aidan. Hi, thank you, Pete. Yeah, good to be here. It's great to have you on, the the second tennis better had on uh, in recent times. Now, we've recently reviewed your service. You've got a tipster service based on the Pick Your Platform, but you're also a a prominent tennis better yourself. And I'm curious about how you got started, because I was doing some research prior to recording this part, and you wrote a dissertation paper encouraged by a university professor on the tennis betting market, which is, it seems to have snowballed, you know, your career now. Tell me a little bit more about that to kick things off and perhaps, you know, a bit about your your background in the betting space in general. Yeah, so it's quite an interesting story, isn't it? Starting off from uh, a university background and gaining my interest in betting through that. It was a case of looking at market efficiency generally and seeing how the sports betting markets provide such a good platform for a test of efficiency because unlike financial markets, you have a clearly defined event and a clearly defined outcome. So from that perspective, I thought, why not do a test on something that's also passionate to me in sports betting? And yeah, so from that point, I did my paper on efficiency of the betting market exchange just to see if there are any kind of returns that could be made from a set entry point in terms of trading. There was nothing that was too sort of suggestive of market inefficiency. I think we we found something about uh, the first set winner generated a small yield or something like that. But that was what piqued my interest in betting as a whole. And I then went on to reading Dan Weston's tennis trading book. Yeah. where I picked up a lot of kind of insights about tennis as a whole, really, looking at tennis from a perspective of compartmentalizing it into different aspects of a match rather than just seeing it as a whole thing. And that was useful in terms of going it from trading to tipping because it gave me a different sort of insight that I feel like a lot of tennis bettors might not have in terms of it gave me that opportunity to see tennis almost from a trading script perspective and Mm -hmm. looking at how a a match kind of develops over time and it has all sorts of different pathways rather than just trying to predict the winner per se. It was about focusing on the kind of the dynamic between the players almost in a sense. Yeah, so it's that script that fascinates me. So uh, it's the intricacies of each particular player and the strengths and weaknesses of their opponent uh, and getting into the detail on that. So so from the actual, I'm curious actually about the dissertation paper. Did your uh, professor ever you know, ever follow up on his love of, of tennis or of betting? Did he start to implement some of these himself? Oh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where he went after that. I know he uh, sent me a few vague emails about potentially publishing my paper and uh, working together on the subject. So yeah, I, I can't actually tell you what he was sort of... Uh, how much of an interest he had in his own tennis betting. He's just kind of intrigued about the efficient market hypothesis as a whole, I'd say. Yeah. So uh, you're doing an economics degree. So obviously you'd made that decision at some point to then start using it as a a way to generate an income, both from betting on it and tipping on it. Talk me through that journey, though, how long that process was and how you've managed to get to the stage where you're at now, where you're making a living from, from what you're doing. So yeah, it started off with sort of trading small stakes for the first six months, trying to just establish whether it was a possible route for me before looking at taking it um, from a more serious perspective. And then tipping came around in late uh, 2017, early 2018. And that was kind of looking at other people's ideas and thinking, oh, I can give my own input and have my own sort of strategies that might be uh, profitable in the markets. And ever since then, it's just almost been a kind of evolving curve in terms of just learning, picking up lessons, always refining my process. And I feel like the way it's happened has just been quite organic. And uh, over time, your bankroll increases, you make more money, it's easier to generate profit. And yeah, now I'm here today and it's uh, a more comfortable process and uh, something that I've got used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense because as your bankroll increases, you're obviously betting with profit, you've got confidence, you've got more data, all these elements combined to give you that confidence to think, well, you know, I can... I can really kind of live off this and I, I can use it as a, as a way to carve out a career, like you say. 
Now, like I say, you're the second person I've had to talk about tennis recently, and I'm intrigued about the process of how you find value and how you find winners in the tennis uh, betting market. So I imagine like most of the listeners, uh, well, for me, you know, I, I follow tennis during some of the Grand Slams and the major events, but maybe I couldn't tell you the 100th player or, you know, the intricacies yeah. of, of all the different competitions and, and the different players. So just walk me through that approach to finding value. Maybe you take an average day because there are a myriad of tournaments that go on every week, aren't there, from not just the, the Grand Slams you talk about, but all these ITF and Challenger tournaments. So, yeah, give me an average day and how you start to trying to equate where value may lie. So it's it's about isolating your, your key opportunities. There might be a lot of events on a given week, but there might be one event that has certain characteristics that make it a more ideal platform for betting. It might be the case that there's a, an event with altitude and when there's altitude, the ball flies through the air slightly quicker. Uh, it changes the sort of dynamic of a match. And you're just looking for key factors, it might be just some small unique thing that can give you an edge essentially and looking to exploit that. There's numerous ways of doing that but I try and keep it fairly simple with my own process. I look at the players that I feel like are either undervalued or overvalued based on the the previous few weeks and um, for the events itself it's based on sort of my past perception of whether that event generates uh, good value or not. So yeah, during the day, it's all about kind of creating a script of where the opportunities might be for finding value. And then over the course of the day, once the matches actually start, you want to have an idea of exactly where your entry points might be if you're trading a match and the exact, uh, the more intricate side of things. Yeah, fascinating because... You know, you, you're taking a holistic view, like an overall view each week at the tournaments and the players and then working out where to, to go from there. So it's breaking it down from, from that point. And no doubt that experience you talk about previous tournaments that are previously. So you go back and I know COVID's probably had an impact on this, but you're looking at what was played, you know, the tournaments and how they panned out in 2020, 2019 and the suitability. Is that the experience over time? Does that help inform your perspective and, and think, well, I know which type of player is going to be well suited to here or this type of player enjoys this this style court or the conditions in this particular tournament? Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd say it's, it's really important to kind of figure out players' exact, what, how their exact game style is going to work on each court. Because even within a surface, it's, it's not necessarily a case that a player will be either good on clay and then not so good on grass. It might be the case that even within a clay court season, there's a lot of variation in terms of their level. They may prefer a clay court that the ball rushes through, but on a heavier clay court where the ball holds up, they struggle so much. So it's about kind of realising where a player's exact strengths lie and where their weaknesses might lie as well. And yeah, over time, you get a better impression of the exact sort of opportunities that there might be with a, a given player, a given event, for example. How much does the motivation aspect from each player play into into selection? You know, maybe you've got bigger name players who are playing in some smaller tournaments. The question mark might be how kind of motivated are they to play in this particular tournament? Are they using it for fitness? Are they using it to genuinely win? Or, you know, are they not too bothered if they get knocked out after they've played, you know, got their fitness up? How much is that a factor in, in how you select some value bets? Yeah, it's, it's actually a very difficult process, I'd say, at times, trying to guess the exact mindset of a player. As you said, it's, a, it's about kind of basing it on past experience. If you know there are certain players like Nadal that might even be at the lower ATP 250 events, but they don't have it in them to not give 100% effort. But then there's other players where they might be coming off the high of a great Grand Slam effort. And you often see it with WTA players that might win a Grand Slam, but then they're back to reality with the day-to-day tournaments and they might lose in the first round in the the next event or whatever. So it's it's really about understanding your players and understanding who's likely to turn up when because a lot of players generally, it can be very varied in terms of what weeks they're going to put in their max effort and which weeks they might be sort of thinking about the beach at the end of the day. (laughs) 
Yeah, but it's, it's the same for many different sports, isn't it? You're trying to second guess the motivation, the prize money on offer, uh, the conditions of, of the tournament. So it definitely uh, makes sense from that point of view. Uh, and how about the tournaments you focus on? Because you talked about a few of them there, the ATP, WTA. Do you want to outline the tournaments that are on offer that, that you bet upon and maybe the different pros and cons of each? So yeah, my main focus is on all the ATP and WTA tournaments. The main reason being that at the highest level, you've got the the Grand Slams and and the Masters events. And those are the ones where you've got the highest level of motivation. And I always like motivation being there naturally rather than a factor you have to guess so much. Yeah, I, I focus on those events generally because there's more data in ATP and WTA because uh, the bookmakers prioritize it. There's more, the players generally face off against each other more often. Mm-hmm. For example, a top 100 player, they're always competing in the same events. Whereas in the challengers tour below, it might be a hundred against a 500 ranked player. And those kind of players don't necessarily end up at the same events a week in and week out. So yeah, it's great for data. It's great for liquidity as well. Um, because in terms of betting on the exchange or pinnacle, you need that in terms of being able to make profit if you're restricted at soft books. Yeah. So when you get into some of the smaller tournaments like the Challengers and ITF, you've got less data. So probably um, bookmakers are prioritizing the pricing on that a little bit lower. So yeah, it's that conflict, isn't it, where you've got less data, you're probably going to struggle to get your bets on quite as easily, uh, you know, in terms of how bookmakers might view those bets if they win and odds are going to shift. So yeah, it's, I imagine uh, it's just like the usual pyramid, you know, where you kind of, like in football, if you start better than the lower league, you probably make a higher ROI, but it's a challenge to get on. Is that the yeah. same thing as you go down the pyramid in terms of the quality of the tournaments? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. As you said, you've outlined all the all the points well there. I feel for me, from a personal perspective, I quite like going for the highest level because uh, I tend to want to have as much information as possible and then just really dig deep in terms of finding the value. Whereas I feel like other tipsters might be better suited at having a lack of information, but being able to isolate exactly what information is important with that lack of information. So I really think there are different pros and cons, but I feel like it's very dependent on the better style as to who's it would necessarily suit. Yeah, okay. And you talk about they're doing research and we talked about the mental side of it and the conditions. How much do you follow like the players on social media? Do you track what they're posting? And, you know, if they've had, I know golf has the nappy factor with newborns and, you know, in terms of travel, are there bits and pieces you pick up from that or is it you leave that to one side? Yeah, I, I feel like it's fairly important in the early rounds, but at the same time, there can also be a lot of noise but just because you, you hear something regarding a player. They might sort of be talking down their chances for a given week, but it might be just to relieve pressure off themselves. So it's always about kind of taking things with a pinch of salt, but at the same time trying to interpret whether that information might be important. I feel feel like there's certain factors where you do need to be a lot more aware of at the start of the week, uh, relating to kind of coming back for a long-term injury or sort of fatigue generally. Those kind of factors are what I'd consider is important to understand from a sort of social media perspective, understanding kind of their fitness and and where they're at with their game currently. That makes sense because, yeah, everyone has access to the same social media. You know, if you're seeing something from a player, you know, everybody else is conceivably and, and the word is spread. So it's like injury news, isn't it? You know, if everyone knows about it, then the market has already factored the injury news into the odds that are available, whatever the competition or sport may be. I want to talk about your edge because you're betting on you know the ATP and WTA and you've you've taken on a sharp book like Pinnacle. We'll talk about your record at, under your name, Aiden at, at Picchio, your tips to site. And there, I think I'm looking at about 11.6 percent ROI. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And that, they're taking on a sharp book like Pinnacle. Now, that's very impressive, as people will attest to. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. On, you know, why you're able to beat them by such a margin. Uh, obviously, we know Pinnacle, they're sharp. But what is it that do you think that they're missing out on? Is it like a, a laziness from their point of view? Are they letting people like you kind of set the market and, and, and fix their rig? What's your take on that? 
Yeah, I find it a kind of fascinating sort of question, really, because I find it difficult to know exactly how Pinnacle are pricing up their markets themselves and, and exactly how that sort of pricing up process of a general price being formed in, in the market as a whole, because obviously you wouldn't have too much arbitrage. But for me, I feel that it's still at the point where the markets aren't efficient at dealing with all the subtle factors. There's um, certain things that the market can still price up wrong. It's a case that you still have to be very patient. There's obviously a lot of matches that I have to bet on or I have the option of betting on, but I'll only select a very sort of small proportion. And it's about really kind of being patient and attacking certain weeks for sure. I feel like there's certainly going back to what I was saying earlier about variation between courts and especially on a given surface, that can sometimes lead to me having very strong weeks on a week where the bookmakers may consistently get a certain factor wrong and that can allow you to sort of generate quick profits when when that's the case. So it's really about sort of being alert to the type of week it is that you're following and then just adapting to the given week. But yeah, I don't think it's laziness in terms of pricing from Pinnacle. I I think it's just uh, it's difficult to factor in everything. And I hear like uh, the best tipsters can kind of take advantage of the subtleties in the mispricings. Yeah, so it sounds like there's quite a fair few inefficiencies in in the tennis markets. And like I say, there's someone that's not a huge follower of tennis. What about the data provision that's provided? Are we we're looking at other sports and? There's a lot of granular data that goes into to like the football in this world. Even sports like cricket are catching up. How does tennis fit on that? Is, is there a lot of work to be done still to kind of get into more detail beyond, you know, who won a game or how many aces uh, one particular player hit? Is there a lack of granular detailed data part of the fact that these markets are so inefficient? Yeah, I, I definitely imagine you're correct to, to point out the differences between uh, football and uh, cricket, I, I feel like there probably is better live data and, and a bigger access due to the maybe due to the fact that, for example, the IPL has su- such a sort of massive following now. But I, I feel like for me, there's enough data in terms of isolating what you need to. There's certain websites like Tennis Insight that provide various filters in terms of price range data, all that kind of stuff. So I feel that there's enough to go off in terms of being able to take advantage, but it's not necessarily enough for bookmakers to price up everything correctly at this point. Yeah. And I was going to also talk about odds movement because obviously Pinnacle, they presumably are aware of you, even if inadvertently, because you know from our research, there is some odds movement and obviously then you go on to be closing line. It doesn't appear that they're they're slashing their odds. You know they've, they've tagged you necessarily, and any time you put up a bet, uh, it gets slashed. Because I've seen that with some other other tipsters that tip uh, on Pinnacle. Do you have any contact with the guys at Pinnacle, or do, do you think they they're aware of you at all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't actually know. I, I feel like uh, it's sort of what you were saying there that you can sort of pick up immediately when there are prices that are being slashed to the point where it's very noticeable. And for my tips, it seems to be a bit more subtle. It seems to be, it might be to do more with weight of money than Pinnacle actually having an understanding of who I am as a tipster. Mm-hmm. My intuition tells me that there probably isn't kind of that sort of understanding. I haven't had any personal contact with Pinnacle myself. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to know. I can't say with any sort of certainty what the exact situation is there. Yeah, because you might be familiar with another of the Piccio stable mates. I think it's Nishikori. I think that's his yeah. name. Tennis. Now he certainly, well, I don't know if it still does, but certainly there was issues with Pinnacle odds being, being slashed very quickly. But again, that might be weight of money, you know, from someone that's been around and widely well known. You know, there's a lot of a lot of money following him, substantial enough to to shift those odds. So that that's fascinating because you know you do have a really good track record, and it's going back to 2019. We'll get onto the tipping site in a while, so no doubt as that continues, Aiden, I'm sure interest will increase from. Uh, sites such as Pinnacle and other yeah. other places, <laughs> which is good. But I, I wanted to ask about we talked about the you know you 
talk then about some of the websites that are available and how much research then do you put in in an average week, you know, and going into evaluating players? Do you spend hours building databases or, or not databases, but documents, dossiers, if you like, on players? Just explain to me the work that goes in because some people might just think, oh, you, you find a bet, you put up a tip, it takes you 10 minutes and then you, you'd work for the day. It's done. I, I imagine it's a little bit more involved than that. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. It, there's a level of complexity to it. For me, I'm numbers driven, but I'm also very driven by what I'm seeing in terms of the patterns unfolding as as a match progresses. But for me, like I'll I have numerous sort of data sheets, but they're often the data that I'm using can be qualitative. It can be, oh, I feel like this player's been underrated for a while, and then I'll have a list of players like that and and so on and so forth. And then having another data set where it's sort of discussing the conditions involved, what kind of angles there might be at this specific event. And then it's about sort of bringing all the data sets together to kind of have a more complete picture of exactly what it is that I'm looking for in a bet. And then once I've considered everything together and also... I think a very important consideration is trying to figure out exactly why a bookmaker has priced up something the way it has. And if you get to the point where you're thinking, oh, I don't actually understand that price, oh, I, I think I should bet it, then I kind of pull the trigger. But it's certainly not a, a process where I'm picking something out in a, in a few minutes or anything like that. So it's a full-time process, effectively. You have to live and breathe tennis and watching tennis and always thinking about it. You're probably lying in bed thinking about tennis at night time. And is that right? It's it's kind of something that's all encompassing. Yeah, it's, it's true to an extent. I certainly think a year or two ago, that was the case. I feel like now it's becoming, I'm seeing that there's an importance in, in life balance as well and having that kind of detachment from tennis. Because uh, as you said, if it can become all consuming, it can also become a bit detrimental in terms of, you can get mentally worn down because there's always tennis on and, and you can just kind of get, as you say, all consumed. So I feel like it's important to be able to know when to step back at the same time as well and uh, detach yourself from what's happening in order to keep yourself mentally sharp for the times that you need to be. No, that's a really good point because I find personally there's always a lot to bet upon. You know, it's running the smart betting club and having opportunities in front of me and things that I know are profitable angles. Some days you, you can do it seven days a week. You can do it you know, as close to 24 hours a day if you'd so wish, but you do need to keep fresh from all points of view, You know, whether it's just to, to make sure that you've, you've rested and, and you can think straight uh, and also to cope with and to see clearly when you're having a bad run, especially I find is, is really important. And I was going to ask you actually, how do you find life though as a, as what in terms of what you do, both from the betting side of it and also the tipping of it, how do you juggle that balance? It must be quite stressful because it's one thing to place a bet and to do you it know, for yourself and, and have significant uh, interest in it, but another thing when you've got a whole plethora of people following it and who might be complimentary or otherwise, uh, depending upon the outcome of that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, otherwise, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's very true that you have to have almost a different mindset for betting and, and tipping to the extent that I think you just have to always focus on the process. I try not to focus on the noise surrounding what people are tending to think about my bets, whether they disagree or agree with it, and just focus on what do I like as a bet, whether I should take that, and then following through with that process. And I, I feel like it's something that I've worked hard on to improve is just being very mindful of the only thing that really matters is the bets that you're taking and making sure that they're value bets. And if you take care of that, then the rest of the process works out for itself. But yeah, it's very difficult at times when you might have had a few bad bets yourself. It can happen. You can make mistakes. You might have factored in something wrong. But then the next day, you, you have a bet where your player has six sets points and he's somehow managed to lose in straight sets and you, you'd be amused as to what's happened and you've suddenly got to be like, okay, that's a, a now a loss and move on. And it, a, a lot of it's about being able to mentally reset, realizing that once uh, something's happened, it's gone. Um, just being able to take the right, correct steps forward in order to 
make adjustments for the next period ahead. Mm. Yeah, that's a refreshing uh, approach because I feel like you need that in betting. You need to be able to uh, evaluate short-term runs uh, dispassionately and and not think, oh, another loser, I'm just cursed. And I think that's how people can approach it sometimes and really totally unconnected events. And it's just, uh, like I say, just sometimes just variance and just the way luck uh, may fall at times. So obviously you have to have a passion for tennis to, to, to make it pay from your point of view would you would you say that's correct or can you just focus purely on it from you know like a numbers betting point of view or do you need to live and breathe tennis yeah i I feel like it's one of those where there's strengths and weaknesses to both approaches either the data driven or having the kind of passion that i do i feel that the data for example you're more able to keep detached from exactly what's happening with the the tennis itself. You might have your own system and all you have to do is follow that system and that keeps a detachment from what's going on. You don't have to really worry too much about the tennis itself and becoming absorbed emotionally. Whereas for me, it's uh, a case where I feel that the passion personally helps, but you have to really work on your mindset as well in order to make that passion pay. I feel that it allows you to dig deeper into a sport. It allows you to make a few more considerations that other people wouldn't think of. When anyone thinks about their own passion, it's something that they can talk about and think about in a a deeper level. And I feel that with sports betting, that can be a real advantage. And I feel that's part of the reason I've been successful today is the fact that you know i'm looking at things from different angles that maybe someone that's um entirely data driven just wouldn't sort of factor in in a sense yeah that's your edge isn't it in a way like your ability to analyze not beyond just the data to get into the mindset and all the other factors we've spoken about yeah that, that's that's really very interesting and i was meant to ask you as well about do you do evaluation of bets after they've taken place or maybe even live do you I speak to some people and they can say, well, that was a losing bet, but I would take that again. You know, they go through the process that you talked about and go, yes, you know, it ticked all the boxes here. It was right. Or then sometimes you might look back at a bet that even won and think, well, I got lucky there. I made some mistakes. Do you spend time going over you know, those bets that you do take, whether they win or lose, and then working out whether you got it all right and whether you can take some lessons from those uh, bets and you know, help improve your process in the future? Yeah, you know what, that's probably one of the most important things for me, actually, is is not so much the what's happening before and and making your bets. It's also about as understanding what's happened with your bet and understanding how to evaluate that. There are certain bets where it's important to not evaluate, like say a player you bet on just turned up unmotivated and it was difficult to predict. It acts as a loss, but you can say you know, you can't take anything from that because it's a fact that you can't really sort of calculate very well or it's it's a random event. But there are certain matches where you might have a player that's just not hitting through the court properly and you could have been able to anticipate that better and it's turned a bet that you thought was good into a bad bet. And from that, you can take the lesson that oh, look, uh, this player can't penetrate this type of court that well. And then you'll know not to make that bet again. And and it's a really important step because if you don't have that analysis and you don't have that evaluation, and there's definitely a problem with uh, a lot of betters potentially having some sort of cognitive dissonance where it's hard to accept that you've made a bad bet or whatever. But for me, it's very important to be able to say that look, I've had a bad bet because I've missed this factor, but I'm going to make sure that I'm accounting for that the next time in order to improve my betting for the future. So for me, it's a very much a kind of ongoing process in terms of making sure that all my bets that I'm taking, that I'm, I'm evaluating them after, and especially with the ones that lose, just making sure that if there's something to be gained from learning a lesson from that, to take advantage of that. Yeah, that's really interesting because I imagine most people just have the viewpoint of that was a good bet because it won <laughs> and that was a bad bet because it lost. But there's so much new, more nuance to to it than that. And I know some people obviously look at closing line value and that's obviously a good barometer if the market is with you on a certain bet and you do obviously do beat 
closing line, you have closing line value, and that's a great sign too. But beyond that, you know, you need to get into intricacies of each bet. So it's really interesting to to hear your take on that and the honesty that you require to go, well, that was a winning bet, but maybe it wasn't, I wouldn't take that again, or I would do things differently. So that's really interesting. Let's talk about then your service at the Picio platform. Like I said, we've reviewed uh, your service in the latest SBC magazine. We've done a an in-depth look at it. We've got all odds monitoring and uh, Monte Carlo simulations and all those other bits of analysis that help us give a really informed view. And before we get into the numbers of it, just talk to me, what made you start the service back in is 2019? Give me an outline of, of the motivation behind getting, getting started on Picio and how it's developed since then. Yeah, so um, it, it was a case that I kind of wanted to challenge myself and uh, see what I was capable of doing at the most uh, efficient betting uh, market. And I feel like uh, when I entered tipping, it it was for the personal challenge and and seeing how I could improve as a better and constantly have that. It provides a sense of self-awareness and being able to make adjustments over time. I feel like it adds to your accountability as a better being a tipster. And I felt like it, in combination, I, I wanted to see what I was capable of doing. And to essentially, I saw tipping as a way of improving my own personal betting. And that's how kind of tipping and picky, my, my service at Picchio came about really was uh, sort of seeing what I could achieve from the tennis betting markets and seeing how I could improve as a tennis better as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, there's like accountability there for you to to have a public record and obviously to to be able to showcase that your edge is, is there and, uh, and you, know, you can maintain it over time. Just tell me through how it all works. So you focus on the, the main events, the ATP, the WTA, and mostly like one player to beat another, but with occasional set bets. Just explain to me the outline of how the service works, when bets go up and that kind of thing. So yeah, I'll, there's four sort of main tennis betting markets on uh, Picchio. There's the first set winner, match winner, Asian handicap first set. And generally speaking, um, most bets will be made on, on the match winner markets. It's the most liquid and it tends to be probably the, the one where there are the most kind of opportunities to bet in a simplistic manner. And then I generally wait until the the later period before a match where there's sufficient liquidity in the in the market for my subscribers to be able to place their stakes. And when I see that a price has sort of hit a high value opportunity in my mind, then I'll I'll take that bet on. And we talked earlier about the profit and loss at eleven point six percent. I've got the numbers here from just short of eleven hundred bets and the average odds of just over six to four in old money, like two point five five. So We've got a really good record there so far, and that's been going since 2019. How did COVID impact things, if at all? I imagine it had a, a fair impact. Yeah, it's, it's had an impact from numerous perspectives. It's had an impact in terms of demand, in terms of a number of supply, even the number of tournaments that are currently being showed. So there's no Beijing, there's no uh, Wuhan, there's no Tokyo. These are all kind of big events that usually I would be able to bet on. So from just that perspective, and then you've got all sorts of considerations to take in terms of, for example, in Australia, you had the bubbles and the two weeks hard quarantine. And it was one of those ones where it can provide a myriad of opportunity in terms of if you can be able to isolate those kind of factors. Some players were in hard quarantine, some players were in like a softer quarantine and being able to deduce what that means. Uh, but like, it's a very hard thing to price up for a bookie. So it's uh, one of those things where it provides certain opportunities if you're able to take advantage. But at the same time, it detracts from finding exactly how the value is just going to be reflecting on the tennis. It's a very difficult thing to factor in. And uh, it's something that I, I'm sure has maybe affected my bottom line in terms of sometimes, you know, you have matches that do have that extra randomness because of you don't know exactly how, you know, COVID might have affected the player or in terms of getting tired about the tour or things like that. And it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely made it a more challenging process, I'd say. 
Because mm, even for someone like yourself who understands the nuances of the players and the intricacies of tournaments, it's very hard to ascertain, you know, how has a player coped with two weeks stuck in a hotel room? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, how they feel, you know, in, in a normal world, in a normal life, you kind of get an understanding of their schedule and their motivations. But that must be uh, a completely unexpected thing to model uh, and to, to add into to your pricing for any particular game. That's just... Yeah. A, no one can know other than people in that inner sanctum of the player's bubble, I suppose. So I also wanted to ask about, we talked earlier about handling losing and being honest with yourself. Now, one of the things that we found in the review, and it's been fascinating to see, actually, is you had a bit of a drawdown in August. You had a bit of a losing run, subsequently recovered from and made those losses back and a chunk of profit. So got the numbers here. You dropped 12.2 points at like minus 27, 28% ROI in August. September was up 18.8 points at 67%. So like I say, there's an edge. What it doesn't talk about is the drawdown. So I think the, it peaked at about 25, 26 points during August. So, and then obviously you've recovered from it. But in that point in August, talk to me about <laughs> your thought processes and how you handled the losing run, any lessons you took from that. Because it's great to see you recover from it. We love to see that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very informative from our point of view of seeing how someone copes with pressure and losing taught me through that losing run though and you know all the lessons you've taken from it oh yeah it was it's it's difficult isn't it it's uh especially since it was uh, a period of a, a few days really where that minus 12 came about i think there was a day where i, I hit minus 10.4 points and uh that was one of those ones where days where it was a real kind of reality check in terms of i think it was i just spent going back to the points made before about making sure that you're a little bit detached. You don't want to be too absorbed. And that day I was too absorbed. I was not analyzing things quite deeply enough and, and missing a, a few factors and still sent out a, a load of tips on that one day and got punished for it. And it's one of those things where, as I said, it, it, it's one of those things that once it's happened, it's happened. But it can also a run or a day like that can add a bit of mental sharpness and steel if you if you allow it to. I, I sort of saw it as something that was quite educational and it was one of those ones where it was like uh, I wanted to focus more on the process again and making sure that every time I send a tip I was in the in the right place and making sure that each bet was something that had could contribute value. And I feel that in September it was uh, I kind of showed that in terms of I felt that almost uh, the strong majority of those bets were, were good ones. And it's certainly a nice feeling, actually, to have one of your worst months followed by one of the best months. It feels like uh, I was happy with my character in terms of showing that there. Yeah, because obviously we're following your service from Smart Betting Club and, and it was interesting and refreshing to see the honesty and the transparency you provided during that period of saying, look, uh, Perhaps uh, there's a few bets there that perhaps on reflection I shouldn't have taken or I need to adjust my strategy subsequently. And, and it's great to see you being honest like that and obviously then to recover because you know very often we see short term, especially tips just coming in and doing particularly well. Uh, and it's easy when you're winning, you know, you, you're betting with profit and everyone thinks you're in the second coming and, you know, <laughs> you're getting nothing but praise and uh, people are, are signing up to your service. But when you're in a downturn and a hard time when people are complaining and you're losing, it's very hard to to kind of cope with that and to then pull it around. And you know, I often do see people, once they start to tank, they never really recover from it because they can't handle that pressure or maybe their edge just wasn't there. They just got lucky. So it's great to see that recovery and, you know, it continues the positive progress of the service. And, so yeah, if you're interested, and rather than then dwell too long on that, if people are interested in it, they can go and read the review because we get into that topic. I also wanted to ask though about your own betting. Well, we got off opportunity. We've got you on Aiden to talk to me about you know how you bet, how much that plays into what you do, your own personal betting, and you know is it obviously you're doing in tennis? Is there anything else you follow? Would you consider yourself a, a professional gambler on other sports at all? Yeah, no, I I've always been very kind of niche in terms of I want to really specialize in, in one thing but get that right i follow some other tipsters in terms of having a portfolio of, of betters and i'm happy to kind of trust uh, other people's expertise in that respect but yeah for me it's uh tennis and betting and 
tipping is slightly different things. I try and with my own betting, a lot of it can be based more on situational opportunities within a match and being able to trade that match on the Betfair exchange. It sometimes can be a bit easier to read exactly what's happening once it's uh, playing out in front of your eyes. So that's uh, maybe the one sort of difference between my betting and my tipping. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, what plans do you have, though, for the future? Obviously, you've, you've really pick your, you've got your own bets. Do you plan to continue as you are or any plans to to develop in any other way? Yeah, um, the, the plan is to largely continue with what's worked to date. It's a, sort of a case of just seeing exactly what the market conditions are at the, the time and just uh, making adjustments based on that if there are still opportunities to bet on. And I'll, I'll kind of keep following this process, which has been working to date. Yeah, absolutely. It has been. It was really good to see and fascinating to track your record and, and to prove you and look forward to, to continue to monitor because there's real potential with your service. And we've obviously seen a lot of that manifest itself. And you've coped with COVID and you've coped with the challenges of quarantine and all, all these different issues that have impacted the tennis market. So just to wrap things up then, Aidan, I, I wondered for those people listening and whether they bet on tennis or, or not, but what advice would you give to those trying to you know, find value bets for themselves? Or even if those people following or looking for a tips to let yourself, what advice would you have for the aspiring punters? So yeah, if someone's trying to find value bets themselves, the key thing that I would, a uh, key piece of advice that I would give is the ability to think differently from the market. You've uh, always got to remember that if you're trying to price something up in a way that's already been priced up, it's not going to lead to profit because it's already factored in to the market itself. So you have to be able to generate ideas or a personal style that leads to opportunities to have an edge. So it's about being able to think differently to how other people are thinking and sort of taking a a contrarian approach really is... uh, That's my own personal uh, style and method anyway in terms of being able to identify value. For following a tipster like me, it's sort of about almost uh, what I've been saying myself in terms of how I bet it's also about just making sure that you're always able to detach from short-term results because it is a long-term process and to just be aware of that noise. But it's also in terms of my own service, it's about making sure that you have the adequate stakes to follow and make a return after subscription costs. And um, yeah, just being aware of whether it's a, a service that can work for them on a personal level. Yeah, some great advice. I definitely back up those, like whether it works for people on a personal level in terms of the time. I've spoken about that in a few podcasts recently. And obviously making sure you have the bankroll. We get into that in the review, you know, talking about who the service, what kind of funds you might need uh, to make it work. So it's a, it's a really good point. Uh, so yeah, if people are interested, the Smart Betting Club review, we're recording this just prior to it being published, but by the time this podcast is out, it'll be available. Uh, you can read a very detailed rundown of Aiden's service. We've got into all aspects of it and you've been good enough to, to kind of provide some quotes and to, to, be able to, to make sure that everything we've put forward is accurate. And I believe I'm working with Pickett and there will be a there'll be a discount available for people interested who are smart betting club members, people interested in, in joining your service as well, Aidan. So I'll put obviously the link to your pick your website profile page on the show notes. But Aidan, is there any way people get in touch? Are you on Twitter, email, or have you just, <laughs> do you prefer to, to kind of leave social media to one side? Tell, is there a way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, yeah. On um, Twitter, I'm at uh, Wadster Tips, uh, W-A-D-S-T-E-R and Tips. Uh, and uh, anyone that has any inquiries about my service, I'm always uh, very happy to communicate with anyone that's uh, got an interest. So uh, feel free to drop me a message on there. Great stuff. So there you go. That's how you can get in touch with Aiden and how you can find out more on his service. So thank you ever so much, Aiden, for for taking the time out. It's been really interesting. You know, someone that doesn't follow tennis all that closely. Uh, I've started to more recently because people like yourselves have piqued my interest. And it's been really interesting talking to you and getting your take on, on, on how you uh, make a profit from the tennis market. So uh, I wish you the very best moving forward and to, you know, we've got probably a COVID impacted Australian Open coming up at the start of the year again and continue to cope with all the 
the slings and arrows of the uh, tennis betting world. So thank you ever so much for your time, Aidan, and I wish you all the best. Thanks to you too, Pete. I really enjoyed being on the podcast today. Wonderful. Thanks, mate.